and uh, we're at the jewelry store, and the person at the jewelry store says, "Oh, so uh, when are you getting married? Are you the, you're the groom, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am the groom." Is that how Thank you, you get so a much. discount? Or <laughs> no, no. She just thought I was. <laughs> I mean, I'm standing there with my wife, and right, and right. it's like, oh. In all so- fairness, you do look quite young. Thank you. Which is a good thing. Yes. You know? So wait, what happened? That good skin. She, they the, thought he was getting married, not that he was the father of... <laughs> oh. To Nora. Yeah, yeah, Nora was real happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, like, look at it this way, Nora. You can always say that I got me... I don't know. <laughs> hey, Nate, hey, let me just be honest with you. Through the viewfinder of this computer i look fine you right on top of me i you know it's, it be bad. <laughs> you know i've seen other pictures of you that are not interpreted by the glories of google hangouts compression system um, yes well you know i'm i am i am filipino i am asian so one day mm-hmm. it's what's going to happen is i'm just going to deflate like a balloon usually yeah, it'll happen around 68 65 68. Yeah. i mean i'm laughing because <laughs> it's that one true <laughs> I know from so many of Eileen's relatives, like <laughs> they just deflate right. like balloons one day. No, it's like it's like twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, menopause, what? <laughs> and then what? everything is like, oh wow, they, that that changed. You know, I, I I met her family for the first time, right, a long long time ago, and it was like all these people who look the same age, and then the grandparents who look <laughs> forty years older. But it was a range of ages, like all the way through, right? Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Hey, what do you guys think? We should do a show. show. About that time. A show would be great to do, actually. Uh, Sarah, would you be so kind as to read the opening on line I three? I would. Let me just make sure my Wi-Fi is off. I would, but I won't. Okay, fine. Wow. Would or wouldn't? Okay. Here we uh, go. Count me in. Okay. Three, two. Thanks to everyone who supports Daily Tech News Show directly. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 20th, 2018 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Scooter Lane. And from my Midwestern art studio, I'm Len Peralta. And somewhere in beautiful Amelia, California, I'm Patrick Norton. And our producer, Roger Chang, is here as well. It's a full house on a Friday. Roger, how are you feeling? I am feeling better than I did Monday. Good to hear. Very good. Good, good, good. We've witnessed Roger's recovery over the week, and we're happy for it. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about a new ISP in Patrick's neighborhood. It may or may not be representative of a trend, but it's very interesting. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Let's do that now. As part of a continuing effort to combat the spread of rumors that have led to instances of violence in India and Myanmar, WhatsApp will limit the number of people you can forward a message to. The limit will be 20 worldwide and five in India specifically. The previous limit was more than 250, so you can see how that would change things somewhat. WhatsApp is also testing removal of the quick forward button in India as well. Waymo announced at the National Governors Association that its autonomous cars have now traveled 8 million miles on public roads. That's double the total they announced back in November. It was 4 million back then. Waymo has 600 Chrysler Pacifica minivans out operating on public roads, and that number is going to go way up soon. They plan to have 62,000 Fiat Chryslers and 20,000 Jaguar I-Pace SUVs on the road within the next several years. Waymo is also testing a ride-hailing service with 400 residents of Chandler, Arizona, and they still say they expect to kick that off as a paid taxi service by the end of 2018. All right, let's talk a little bit more about a new open standard. Don't stop listening. Don't fall asleep. It's it, Actually, you're going to want to use this. Yeah, this is called the Data Transfer Project. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Twitter have all created the Standards Initiative, the Data uh, Transfer Project, I guess DTP, 
for short, uh, for transferring data directly between services without the need for you to download and re-upload. That's very important. Data is encrypted in transit, issuing forward secret keys. The system supports transfer of photos, mail, contacts, calendars, and tasks, drawing from publicly available APIs from Google and Microsoft and Twitter and Flickr, Instagram, Remember the Milk, and Smug Mug. Remember the milk, man, haven't heard about them in a while. Code for the project is available on GitHub. Yeah, so, and, and there are a few other smaller companies uh, involved in this. We don't wanna leave everybody out, uh, but it's there's actually yeah. not one single place to find out about the organization because they're pretty much focused on putting the code up on GitHub. Though I guess you can go to datatransferproject.dev. Uh, but the, the, the thing that you should think about is right now, because of GDPR, there's a lot of companies making available the ability to download your data and, and even delete it and remove it. So if you want to leave Instagram, you can leave Instagram. But what do you do with that? There's not a lot of work being done on what to do with that data if you're like, well, I want to go back to Flickr with my Instagram. I want to take all my photos over there. Uh, or even, I think, more practical are things like calendars and address books. You have to download it, and then you have to upload it. This would develop a secure way to just say, hey, I'm I'm transferring it over here. Let me authenticate on both ends. And then you guys take care of it on the back end. Patrick, have you gone through this recently where you've got so much data on a certain platform that if there was a standard <laughs> such as this to move over to you know the next big thing, you would take advantage? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, um, I've been listening to too much uh, Harry Potter with the boys and audiobooks lately. I'm just going to say, Brilliant, um, because a uh, from looking at these particular like the companies at the, the center of this, um, pretty much all the big companies except for Apple. I look at this and I think this is a way to help stave off any of a number of the issues they're worried about uh, in terms of being sued or attacked or beat on with a hammer by government agencies. Uh, but the idea of making this data portable and easy to move from place to place. I mean, if you've ever tried to move, say, 11 million photos off of Flickr. Um, or, you know, yeah, just the idea of trying to move your data out. I mean, I still pay for Flickr Pro because I'm right. scared of this entire thing. <laughs> Which is a perfectly reasonable response. But yeah. I mean, I'm also kind of curious to whether or not, I, I'm curious to whether or not like Facebook, for example, would ever allow you to sort of A, download your data and B, not keep all of it. Could At this point, could Facebook even tell where all of your data is inside of their system? Well, they, um, they need to if they want to operate in Europe, because that's part of the deal is you have to be able to say, get rid of it all and delete it. So um, yeah, point taken. interesting question. Um, <laughs> we've I, heard I do, before. As far as, as far as the data transfer project, goes, I do like that it's using existing APIs and authorization mechanisms. So it's not trying to reinvent right. the wheel. If you don't trust existing APIs, that's a whole different situation, but it's not adding in a lot of vulnerabilities. It's encrypting what little connections, the specific adapters that it's using to connect to those two APIs together. Uh, but if you are, if you use third party clients for Twitter, you're using right. an API, right? So, so this is as secure as that is right now and it just sends it from one service to the other and if you trust both of those services which maybe you don't trust the one you're leaving as much maybe that's why you're leaving i don't know but you you right. know you you should trust the system and it's intended to be open source it's not quite got a license and everything i couldn't find all the details on that uh, but they do want to make this an open source platform that anybody can use I like the idea because when you dig into the, the data transfer project website, they talk about how it's okay. We're you know there's there's data adapters and authentication adapters, and the idea that these are supposed to sit outside of the infrastructure of the partners so that they won't because a lot of these a lot of these tools a lot of these these websites or whatever you want to call them uh, social services, um, you know they are incredibly complicated and arcane and because almost every one of them went through some point, for example, Facebook or, or Twitter, where they exploded and a lot of code got heaped on top of the core uh, functions. Um, it's super, super messy to try to dig in deep. So they're trying to to make it easy to export and easy to import, right? So, yeah. you know, we have this standard for data. And then there's also part of me that goes like, oh, it's a really fancy comma delimited file for all of your information inside of <laughs> I mean, Google. I and we all know, because everybody's yeah. trying to export stuff in a comma delimited file and it's it is you know what 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 spec could be more it's, it's so about, easy it's about you know? the security damn it well yeah. it's about the security but it's still it's like is as easy as this should be um 
you know, having had incredible failures on transferring simple, simple, simple data, yeah. like it, you, your contacts to go from, you know, I don't know, uh, let's say lo, lo, it's something everyone here, except for maybe Len, will, will react to viscerally, Lotus Notes, just yeah. trying to get your contacts out of Lotus Notes and into anything else in the planet. Like, yeah. did it work on the first try, the seventh try? Oh, I mean, the Lotus Note story is... It's a whole thing. <laughs> you it's, know? A, it's an ongoing GDI topic. Uh, that's why I brought it up. But but this is if this works, it'll be freaking amazing. Um, you know. All right. Uh, we got six products: Apple Watch, Fitbit's Charge, Charge HR, and Surge, and Sonos's Play Three, Play Five. Oh, and I guess it's seven products: the sub speakers as well, that are listed as subject to import duties if the new round of proposed tariffs on Chinese good goes into effects. Uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection considers the items data transmission machines, which is one of the 6,000 codes used for types of goods listed on that next round. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but these tariffs don't just happen because the president says so. They go through a comment period, and the comment period for these tariffs is happening right now. So the device makers can use that period to ask for the code of that particular vice to be dropped from the list. They can ask for their product to be reclassified as a different code. They could apply for an exclusion, saying even though our code is listed, can our device not really count? Uh, or they could just replace it with a newer model that turns out works differently and somehow isn't subject to the tariff. But you'll, you're, you're seeing a lot of headlines out there saying uh, the tariffs will cause these products to get a 10% tax on them. May happen, may not probably not going to happen because they have so many options to deal with it and a lot of time to prepare for it. Well, okay. So as somebody who owns a Sonos One smart speaker, the, I, I assume that the whole idea of this is anything that's manufactured in China and can be, you know, it, everyone knows it's, it's being imported. And the, that's why older Sonos models are part of this and not the newer Sonos models that actually would no, apply to me. I wish it was that simple, but okay. that's not how it works because mm. iPhones are manufactured in China and they are not covered by any of these tariffs. Mm. And the president oh. has said he's going to make sure that that doesn't apply to that. It, it's specific types of devices and there are 6,000 different codes for the types of devices. And so there's, there's very intricate definitions for how you qualify, whether you count under a certain one or not. Yeah, I, I thought it was clever that they immediately, at the very beginning of this, were like, we're not going to put tariffs on cell phones because that would have dramatically impacted a huge number of Americans instantly. And the but, fact is, the, these ones, the, the, these companies said, which ones of our products count under these proposed tariffs as part of the comment period? Customs right. said, these <laughs> count. And now that's the chance for the manufacturers to go, okay, great. So now we have to figure out our strategy to make sure that those don't count so that they don't get hit with the tariff in the future. There was an interesting, I think it was like a few weeks ago, uh, Move, the subwoofer company that makes like vintage, basically vintage, new vintage subwoofer, subwoofer or not subwoofers, uh, synthesizers, how they pointed out that so many of their sub assemblies come from China and that is going to dramatically impact the cost of goods. And I think right now, anybody who deals with anything that gets manufactured or any part of their device, which is a huge list of things gets manufactured in China is probably freaking out calling their local Congress critter and trying to figure out how they can get exempted on this. Um, well, Patrick, let's see if this next story freaks you out. Amazon <laughs> has rolled out a feature called Part Finder for its iOS app based on the acquisition of Part Pick, which was back in 2016. So Part Finder uses the phone's camera to identify a part and then get links to order replacement parts. Users have to place that part. It's usually a part of a larger machine next to a penny. So you can kind of, you know, get a sense of how big it is and then add some identifying information. For example, whether it's a Phillips or flathead screwdriver, et cetera. Right now it can recognize screws, nuts, bolts, washers, and other fasteners. It's awesome. Um, Pretty cool. I, I would, I would demonstrate it right now, but I don't have a penny in my pocket. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of weirdly located in the, uh, in the Amazon app. You have to hit the photo button in the corner of the app. And then you get something that looks a lot like that, which is probably I completely. Can't see that. Oh no! Can't I see that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see that. Most most wow. people listening can't see that. Well, <laughs> imagine if you will a photo screen with a little label that says "Welcome to Part Finder." A photo of a fastener provided by Patrick <laughs> Norton. 
you know, it's uh, and you have to have a white surface to use it on. So if you're in the backyard in the garage and your grimy ass workbench, uh, you need to go find a nice clean white sheet of paper and a penny to do this. Um, I think it's cool. Uh, I've, I've only tested it out with like one very common screw and it seemed to work. Um, I'll be actually be reviewing this on tech thing on Tuesday oh, nice. because well, I was just like, this is going to be so cool if it actually works. Um, well, and and you can you can reverse Amazon, right? Amazon's known for being the app that you take into Best Buy and then look up the thing in Best Buy to find out if you could find it cheaper. You can use this to identify the part and then go find it at your local hardware store if that's easier for you. Because I don't want to sh have a screw shipped to me in a big package. Like I, I want just want to find out which one it is. Yeah, no, I'm I'm totally. It was I'm, I'm laughing is like. Uh, Ryan Trout uh, from PC Per and I were talking about this yesterday, and he was like, "I don't need a box of 200 screws." I'm like, "No, but sometimes you do need a box of 200 screws. But right. if you only need one, you can at least know where to start looking in your local totally. hardware store." Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Well, and Amazon's aware of this, right? They're aware that oh, yeah. people use this as a you know a research tool, of not course, not necessarily you know to 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 make the um the eventual sale, but you know that's part of their cloud service as well. All right. Attackers have accessed 1.5 million patient profiles and 160,000 prescription details for Singapore's largest healthcare institution, SingHealth. They basically have two big ones that work with the government. SingHealth is the biggest. Singapore's Ministry of Health believes that the target of the attack records were Singapore's ministers from the government, particularly the prime minister, Lee Shen Lung, whose prescription details were among those accessed. Government says it was not the work of casual hackers or criminal gangs, but a deliberate targeted and well-planned cyber attack. Uh, the prime minister said he guesses, he's like, I, it's, my prescription information isn't something I'd normally share with people, but there's nothing embarrassing in there. Uh, he's like, maybe they thought they could find out something that I, it wasn't public. There is no evidence that the records were altered uh, or that the attackers were able to access diagnoses or test results or doctor's notes. Uh, so there, you know, we always like to know how bad the attack was. This was getting addresses, email, uh, addresses, uh, things like that for 1.5 million and some prescription information again for the 160,000. But I, I've, you know, we don't report on every breach anymore because there are so many of them, sadly, but this is an interesting one because it does seem to be a different kind of state sponsored attack. Going after Singapore, particularly, maybe it's a rival party but they must have paid somebody because these are attackers who knew what they were doing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think we're all. I hear you. I hear you. I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with like a witty rejoiner, but I'm like, well, <laughs> well it's not like we we have you're so many. The person these, right? who had your health records uh, accessed as part of this. I mean, yeah, exactly. we have had a a, a a similar number of health records accessed in the United States piecemeal, right? With multiple right. attacks here and there. Uh, there were some big ones in the in the background check uh, for the government at one point that got a lot of information that way. Not necessarily health information, but but yeah, I mean, I know what you mean. There's this is this is somewhat stunning. I, I don't know. It, it's I'm, I I want to be more shocked than I should be at this point. But uh, given the amount of hacking, the intensity of hacking, the variety of hacking, from incredibly sophisticated, just like brute force, um, you know. Well, this is this is definitely a step above. This is not. Right. This is not uh, ransomware. Uh, we wanted to make some money. This is this is intrigue. This is this is uh, James Bond level hacking. If you yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, I'm not arguing that it may have been James Bond level hacking, but it's still, I mean, compared to like, you know, looking at the Office of Personnel Management being hit in the United States in 2015, and basically like all of the data. Singapore is reputed to be super reliable and careful about these things. I think that's yeah. the part that shocked me. And they have no idea who or where it came from. Not yet, or if they do, they're not saying. Huh. Well, you guys want to talk about robots? Sure. All right, let's do it. DARPA announced a new program called SHRIMP for Short Range Independent Macro Robotic. Not micro. to be confused with my Macrobiotic. Mi micro. micro Robotic platforms <laughs> to develop and demonstrate multifunctional micro to milli robotic platforms to use in natural and critical disaster scenarios. So SHRIMP will consist of a series of com competitions performing tasks quote, associated with maneuverability, dexterity, 
and manipulation. So there'll be one set of competitions for actuators and power sources and one for complete robots. DARPA will allocate $32 million of funding across multiple shrimp projects. Abstracts are due on August 10th. Proposals are due on September 26th with competitions perhaps as early as March 2019. I can't wait for uh, the petite range amplified wireless na nanotech. I was trying to come up with prawn. Sorry. No, this is really good. <laughs> um, I was trying to figure out what you were trying to spell. I, know, I was like, he's getting somewhere. Print? Just let him work <laughs> through it. Yeah, I, I I think this is fantastic because a lot of times we we think of you know oh DARPA you know the DARPA Grand Challenge and the big robots and the walking and the everything and and they do all that, uh, but this is much more practical <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> like having having small devices that can get into places and disasters is going to be much more useful. I think. I love the. Uh, did anybody look at the tentative events for the actuator and power source competitions? There is a high jump. The microbiotic actuator power system must propel itself vertically from a stationary starting position with a distance measured only in the vertical direction. Yeah, it's Expected like, it's like an five. Olympic Games for yeah. robots. You know, it's like, well, can you do this? Because this is really hard as a robot. Yeah, you know, there's you know, a we're biathlon. All these, you know, yeah, we have all these new <laughs> challenges of like, you know, if you can get here, you're like a pretty good robot. The biathlon has competing teams given the choice between three beacon types, temperature, light, or sound, and they may choose to use all three types of beacon. For each attempt, the micro robot must traverse a series of beacon waypoints to create an open circuit without human interaction. So awesome. Vertical ascent, a steeplechase. Not really biathlon. They're not shooting. Well, <laughs> yet. Oh, yes. 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 Actually, there was a whole thing yesterday signed to keep them from shooting, at least without our supervision. Uh, so maybe that's why. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for listening. Uh, get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes. If you're like, I, I love hearing about this, but sometimes I'm in a rush. And I just want to know the news. DailyTechHeadlines.com. Go check it out. You can get it in your ears and even on your Amazon Echo. And that is a look at our top stories. So, Patrick, you were telling me there's a new ISP in town, which, you know, in various parts of the world, the United States included, ISP competition is not as good as maybe it should be. Sure uh, and so, so this is a, a great example of when competition happens, what happens? Tell us about it. Okay, so it's been I, I, several thousand times over the last 2,000 years, over the last probably 10 or 15 years, I've said, if there is ever a viable replacement for Comcast, I will be on it immediately. And... Uh, in, in terms of viable, I actually had to be able to afford it um, because high enough speed, low enough price, right? Yeah, and and it's been the you know when you spend a lot of time also working and pushing video files uh, around the web, what you really want is a higher upload speed. For me, in particular, uh, was something I was desperately looking for. And if you go to Comcast, they're like, well, we well, can give you thirty megabits up. It'll only cost you four times what your current phone bill does or your your current cable bill does. Um, I may be exaggerating slightly, but not by much because mm, yeah. basically it meant going from a consumer to a business account. Um, and it's been interesting to look at uh, because there's almost never been in my particular area any alternative that was uh, as fast as, much less faster, Comcast. And, you know, it doesn't really matter, Charter, wherever you are, you probably run into a situation where there's mediocre DSL um, or fairly fast cable. Uh, if you're very, very lucky, there might be a, a wired option, or sorry, I should say a wireless option. Mm. And if you're incredibly lucky uh, in, in approximately this much of the United States, as he holds his fingers together and points them towards the camera for everybody listening at home, um, if you're in this tiny subsection of the United States, you might actually have access to fiber. And, uh, you know, anything involving pulling wires or burying wires is incredibly expensive. And that's why, despite the fact that we hear a lot about the free and open market, if there was a real need for a less expensive way to get internet in the homes, the free market would have provided it. Uh, it but it's incredibly expensive to uh, dig holes in the ground and drag cables through them or to- Not to mention it sometimes it requires regulations uh, mm -hmm. that the telcos have lobbied to make difficult to get approval for. Yeah, I don't even get me started on the incredible efforts by Verizon's and other, uh, other organizations to stomp the possibility of munici municipal ISPs into the ground because God forbid, uh, their lack of interest in providing better service to their companies, uh, their, 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 their consumer bases be replaced by a, the self-interest of local government. Damn Get that. us to the good stuff, though. What's, so what's happening in your hood? 
So uh, this, uh, I, 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 I saw a sign for uh, Common.net. And Common.net works is a startup uh, out of San Francisco. And their very, very first test case, uh, shockingly and delightfully enough for me, was here in Alameda, California. And they are working on their probably, I assume they are working towards, based on a couple of conversations I've had, I'm pretty sure they're working towards their own proprietary hardware. Currently, they're using uh, Ubiquity hardware. Um, the Unify uh, wireless access points. And what they're creating is, you know, I'll call it a mesh network, but it's not a mesh network like I have a bunch of Netgear Orbeez in my house. It's a mesh network as in they are creating a collection of wireless access points that are on the roofs. Uh, they start with tall buildings. In the, they started, I should say, with a couple, three tall buildings in the city, and then they kind of work out the math from there as they add additional uh, clients or houses. They then sort of point additional, you know, there was like one antenna on top of my house, now there's three. And when I say antenna, they're little sort of eight-inch size circles that are on a mass on top of my house. And to give you an idea of, of how successful this is, they've, they've been around for a year or two. There are like 20 houses on my block, and five or six of them are already using Common. And we, so, we've the close listeners to DTNS will will realize this sounds familiar because we've talked about similar systems. I think mm -hmm. Colorado there was a municipality or a subdivision maybe yeah. uh, that was that was putting this in. Uh, we've seen it put in and, and tested in a few other places. I think maybe in Idaho, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's interesting to see it in action, right? That, that's yeah. why I'm so curious to talk to you about it because the you know the idea is always hard to get, it's hard to get the first person to put that mast on their house, but once they do, the more people <laughs> add to the network, the more robust the network gets. Absolutely, and, it, and it's been, it's uh, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna amplify what Tom said, this is not a new idea. Um, you know, this is a particularly well implemented version of it. And also, uh, I think it, in terms of pricing, they're being pretty generous. Um, you know, I pay $50 a month, they guarantee when I signed up, it was 50, uh, 50 megabits up, 50 megabits down. Uh, they've now bumped that to 75 megabits up and 75 megabits down. And no and price increase. That's nice. No, yeah, no price increase. Uh, $50 a month, which is, a, you know, I want to say $39 less than I was paying uh, for Comcast and getting uh, uh, 10 megabits up and I want to say 50 to 80 megabits down. Mm -hmm. What's crazy about this is, is you know, except on like Friday night when everybody in the in, in the city of Alameda is streaming Netflix or Amazon Prime, um, I'm typically getting 175 megabits up and 175 megabits So when they guarantee, when they give you a number, it's the minimum, not yeah. you might hit this someday if conditions are perfect, which is what you usually get from cable. Well, okay, yeah. so here's my question as well. So I'm looking up common networks on Crunchbase, and it looks like they've been through a Series A, which means they haven't raised all that much money. How Ooh. long? And it, yes, and as you said, Patrick, it's so great that Alameda was a, you know, a test bed for this. How long before a, a, a large company like Google or somebody else who wants to... Um, uh, uh, absorb an ISP such as this into their uh, portfolio picks up common? Well, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question um, because my nightmare, <laughs> so we've all worked for some wonderful venture capital funded organizations. Um, three things happen when companies get a, a metric ton of venture capital. Um, either A, they get a metric ton of venture capital and they kind of piss it all away and they fail, or B, they get a certain amount of venture capital and they get bought by a very good company, or C, they get a certain amount of venture capital uh, and they actually want to be a standalone company and at no point does the, the VC make them do a lot of stupid things in order to turn what should be a $10 million year business into a billion dollar year business. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I can't talk too much smack because I, I, I took a lot of paychecks from VC funded companies over the last 10 years. Oh, totally. I think my but question is more of if you had to guess what larger company would want something like this, <sighs> but, uh, you know, other, where would you go to, with? The other thing to consider is that 5G wants to do what Common is doing without necessarily exactly. having to put the masks on your house although there are yeah. some plans to do that too. So either they you, you start to see AT&T and Verizon go into competition with Common or possibly buy them. That's one option. Well, yeah, the, the, I don't think there would be any... Okay, so when you look at, at companies that are probably going to roll out 5G, which is basically every major uh, uh, mobile carrier in the United States, I don't think it gives them any advantage because they're using such a radically different infrastructure. Um, you know, if it was Google... Sure, why not? But the reality is, is Google could probably do this internally as well or better. And quite frankly, I was kind of shocked been, that they, they have been examining that for Google Fiber. The Google Fiber yeah. unit 
has been looking at doing exactly this. Yeah, because I, you know, it, I was I was as excited as the Google Fiber project was for me. I was also kind of like that. Even Google's pockets aren't really deep enough to dig that much fiber to to really kick the teeth in at at, uh, at Comcast. Mm. Um, and you know, obviously, I have an anti Comcast bias because I've been a customer for so long. But uh, the uh, I, for me, I'm, I'm actually that's my primary concern is like a they don't accept so much venture capital uh, that the VC guys are like great, just up the uh, two hundred dollars a month and cap it at eight megabytes and you know you'll really be able to make money then because that's kind of a classic venture capital response um i'm hoping they hope to stay independent um most of the crew uh most of the leadership in common uh, seems to have come out of stripe they seem to be pretty serious engineers they seem to be fairly focused on uh customer service all of which sounds nothing like um comcast or charter or at&t or verizon or any of the others um i mean yeah certainly verizon and at&t um are going to be competitive with 5G. I'm really curious to see how they price that because you know at this point when you look at the way uh, all of the major wireless carriers um, price their wireless data, um, they do not want heavy consumers. They want basically they want everybody at like 22 to 25 gigabytes a month, and they don't want to deal with you if you're going over that. Now, in, in there are cases we, we we do have anecdotal evidence from some of the, like the tech thing uh, viewers where they're like, yeah, I'm typically at 37 or 40 megabytes a month and, or gigabytes a month, and they don't throttle me. Um, but when you start looking at the pricing plans, you know, up until about a year or two ago, you used to be able to like, yeah, I need 50 gigs a month, and now you just can't go over. Like if you get to a certain point, the carriers are going to throttle you because they just don't want to deal with carrying that much bandwidth over the 4G network. Well, most of them will let you pay for, for the ability to go over. They uh, actually are, no, actually, Tom, many of them have actually eliminated the ability to do that. I can no longer pay for extra bandwidth at AT&T. So if right. I'm at, I'm at CES. Can, and I'm, well, maybe AT&T got rid of that and I didn't realize it, but you can with Verizon and T-Mobile. So Okay. Yeah. The last time I looked at Verizon, they were in a similar situation. And the other thing is, I, this is a good time to point out, they keep changing. Yeah, I know. It's hard to keep so up. Regularly. For um, sure. Well, thanks for sharing the insights on, on that. Uh, again, we're not particularly saying common is you know, em emblematic or, or, right. or, or anything, but it was interesting to to see it on the ground from somebody who's tried it out and used it. And it will become something with Google and 5G and other companies that are similar yeah. uh, that you may see coming to your neighborhood soon. Oh, that means the time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that was off. Uh, yeah. re real quick, just wanted to um, highlight uh, one of our mailbag op uh, 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 our, our mailbag uh, emails. Emails, exactly <laughs> from Tom. How do, you, how do you submit submissions? Thomas says uh, he's a terrible film critic extraordinaire. Those are his words. He says he has some thoughts on our DC Universe discussion from yesterday's show. Thomas says, I don't think you guys gave nearly enough credit to the fact that they're bringing back the show Young Justice. It was a massive cult hit from earlier in the decade, universally praised. One of my favorite shows of all time, unfortunately canceled by the Cartoon Network after two seasons. I hear your pain, Thomas. Uh, the outcry from fans, though, was followed by one of the most intense I've ever seen. And the subsequent excitement at the idea of a revival was even more so. And that's going to be on DC Universe. Thomas says, I guarantee DC Universe will receive at least a lot of subscribers off the bat from this basis alone. If they get it right, maybe people will stick around out of pure enthusiasm. Maybe I'm being blinded by my fandom on this particular show, but weirder things have certainly happened in the streaming world. And if I'm right, Young Justice might be the key to DC Universe's success. Hmm. All right. Mm. I think if you ask people who are fans of Titans, they will say the same thing. I think if you ask people who are fans of the comics, which we actually got a couple of emails like that, they will say, oh, it's the comics. And I, I think that's what is so interesting about DC Universe is it's not just a video streaming service. It's not just one particular show that's going to bring people in like Star Trek Discovery is often seen as CBS All Access. It's multiple live action shows. It's back catalog. It's comics. It's forums. Uh, so you know, getting this many different perspectives on that from Young Justice to Titans to comics, et cetera, mm -hmm. is probably a really good sign for DC. You know, I was kind of I was kind of thinking about Thomas's uh, note earlier. It's like Friday Night Lights. Remember when it got picked back up or yeah. Arrested Development? It's like mm -hmm. there is a momentum that totally. he's talking about that is real. 
All right, let's check in with Len Peralta, who's been illustrating uh, this episode. Len, what do you got for us? Well, you know, it's my first week back after a week off, and I um, wanted to do something that was a little bit less brain-intensive than Common Networks. And, of course, I, I chose DARPA and the, and the shrimp, uh, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, and this image is... You know, these these are small robots, folks, very, very tiny. And, of course, it's making these real shrimps feel really big. And uh, I guess that's what they call them, jumbo shrimps, and that's what this is called. Jumbo it's gonna, shrimp. It's, it's going to make popcorn shrimp feel jumbo. It's <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. true. <laughs> and what about coconut shrimp? I don't yeah. know what it's going to do for them. But, uh, uh, it's going to make them feel tasty. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but if you want to see what Len drew, you got to check this out. It's really cute, actually. It's I've got a whole under the sea vibe. So uh, where should they go? Beep borp. Oh, they should go to lenperaldastore.com and uh, check it out along with all the other great stuff that is available on the store. Thank you, Well, Len. thank you so much, Len. And also thank you to Patrick Norton for being with us this fine Friday. Patrick, where can people keep up with what you've been up to lately? Oh, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com. Tech Thing, the show I host weekly with Shannon Morris and AB Excel, the home theater and audio podcast do with Mr. Robert Heron, which is also a weekly kind of thing. Excellent. Thanks to everybody who supports us directly on Patreon. Uh, we have all kinds of cool perks for people there, including the ability to listen to the entire Good Day Internet. That's the pre and post show, along with DTNS, live as we record it in Discord. You can hook up your Discord to Patreon and listen along with us. All kinds of other stuff. Check it out at patreon.com slash DTNS. Hey, if you've got feedback, questions, comments, anything, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send us an email. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Have a great weekend, everybody who's in a weekend, and we will talk to you Monday with Justin Robert Young. Le weekend. Hang out with me, too. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> I was thinking like people who listen when it's Monday because they. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Not, not people program. who personally know the artist The Weeknd. <laughs> oh, I love The Weeknd. Speaking the of weekend. which, I'm going to I'm going to log off. because You should I'm begin your weekend, Len. I'm going to go to The Weeknd, yes. and uh, Tell him we said hello. I will. Enjoy, Enjoy your, your analog weekend. Enjoy your shrimp. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. It's good seeing everybody. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks, Good Len. artwork, Len. See you Thank next you. week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, Love you. Bye. Bye. All right. All right. Bring a penny, get a part. I feel like I'm I'm announcing Jeopardy categories. <laughs> what uh, is? Right, right. <laughs> bring a penny, get a part. Um, <laughs> and finally. I'll take bring a penny, get a part for 200. Project. <laughs> uh, it's a daily double. <laughs> da, da, da. You're down with DTP. <laughs> <laughs> you faded away, Roger. Where are you, Roger? Oh, no, I'm Roger. trying to find. I'm trying to find something that coincides with the discussion. Having trouble. That's luck. That's Uncommon luck. That's ISP. Uncommon. Yeah. Wait, I don't see oh, that. Goodness. Uncommon bandwidth. No, I'm just making these up. There's a Subaru know. Brat for sale in Reading. <laughs> You don't want to buy those. Those things are like 40 years old. Oh, no. I want a brat. See? And it's got the jump seats in the back. So. They have the jump yeah, seats. It it's like, like it's like the only car that like says brat on the side of it. It's so cool. You know why they put the seats in it? So it wouldn't qualify as a truck and would get around uh, import tears. No, and this no, is a problem. No. Why, You're thinking of like an El Camino. A brat was never a truck. No, a it was. A no, a Brad is Brad, is, a Brad is like a it's like a it's like a um I don't know. I don't, it's like, a car. My, my friend had it's one. A spoiled child that <laughs> No, a Brad's kind of like an El Camino. Yeah. You've never seen one before? It's very, it's got very tiny. But I would, I I just don't think anybody would call that a truck. Oh, that's why no, they no, put that's what Roger's saying. Oh, it's, okay. That's what it looks like. Cuz you get the bed of a truck, but they didn't have to pay the import Tax, tax on the truck as long as they the, put the jump seats in the yeah. bed okay so can, okay you gotta find one with the I, I guess I think paint. of it yeah like it's like a wagon without the the back on well it. it's a car that only seats two people and has a big trunk <laughs>
Patrick, buy that brat. <laughs> right here, uh, see right here, jump seats. The USA Canadian versions also had carpeted and welded in rear Look, facing. You can Sorry. you can fit in the back of one. All right, uh, all right. I I they I, were I, a tariff avoidance back. ploy with the plastic seats and the cargo bed allowing Subaru to classify the brat as a passenger car, charged only with two point five percent compared to twenty five percent tariff on light trucks due to the chicken tax. Uh, Sarah, you are correct. The the coolest part is that it has brat written on the side. Oh Not yeah, all of them have no, brat it's like, on the side. Like, that was an optional graphic. Um, I've never seen one without the brat on the side. Not once. Why would you? Not pay for that option. Come on. Mm. If how you're going to get a brat, hands from the 80s you're going to make sure that point. people know that you get an El Camino that. at that point. Yeah. What's wrong with you? You get, El, you get a ranchero. A ranchero. And eggs in it. There's actually an El Camino in my neighborhood. Um, it's this beautiful, just kind of like, you know, they obviously did the paint over and it's black and they've got great rims and like, there's no part of me that needs this car, <laughs> but, but, but in my it. soul, I want it to be mine. Yeah. I, I haven't called anybody to see how much it they is. Still like, make, that's a cool car. I don't know if the Rancheros, El Caminos are a different brand, but they still make that kind of car in Australia. I saw several of yeah. them that were, were yeah, they're models. Huge. And they were new. Yeah. They're, they're, the, yeah. For, they're, the, um, they're the Ford Falcon Ute, and then there's the... Uh, Holden, which is GM. Yeah. Holden. Um, what well, is it? I don't I know that much they're about They're actually them. not. They're, they're stopping. I'm not, they're not stopping, but they're, the sales of those particular body styles are dropping because the cost of imported Ranger pickups from Thailand as well as uh, hmm. other uh, Asian uh, pickup manufacturers are so much cheaper. Hmm. Um, I guess. I mean... Being a petty, get a part. I, I love that one so much. Maybe it's changed a bit. Maybe it hasn't. But when I was a kid, again, we lived in the country, but it was like you had a car and you had a truck. Mm -hmm. You had to have a truck because you had to load things into the back of the truck and take them places around. and go to the dump. And like you needed a truck. That's, you know, Dude, that's what they said. almost every family had a truck because otherwise you had to borrow someone else's truck. Right. So we take just, things places. Just, uh, I sat in one of these. So and, maybe in the certain places of Australia, it's still you know, you know, a high ticket item as it would be in the U.S. It's consi it's the pickup of Australia. That's what people who yeah, buy them had the station things. wagons for that instead of trucks because we were a little bit you know we were in the but city. What if you had, had to put like people. lumber in the back? Oh, yeah, you know? like you don't lumber. want it to be like enclosed. Yeah, my dad put lumber in the back of the Rambler yeah, all the time. You just roll oh, really? the window yeah. down. Let it hang yeah, out the yeah, back. That's yeah. the yeah. red flags yeah. are for. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Or you just buy a, a the suburban and yeah. then you just open the giant. That was a Nash yeah. Rambler. That's what we had. That's awesome. Yeah. We 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 always had a Ford truck. And then, like, we had a camper that you could take on and off. Mm -hmm. So, like, if we were going camping, mm -hmm. have the camper on, like, yeah. the kids is in the back and, you know, like, you know, right. we, we sleep in there. But otherwise, it would be like, yeah, we're taking stuff to the dump. But the station wagon kind of went out of vogue and... And the, and, and, and the ones place. that stuck around got smaller. And so, I, and like, my sister was like, oh, yeah, just we just have F-150s. That's, that's all she has. I don't know. I'm still wrapping my head around the idea of Ford dropping everything, but the trucks and well, they're dropping the them in the U.S. They're still going to yeah. keep cars overseas. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm it's well. Still, part of it's it just, is uh, that the they're classifying their crossover vehicles, which can be like a very tall. Basically, it's SUV built off a car chassis. Right. Um, they're classifying those as trucks. They're not because they can they can skip some of the uh, um, cafe rules. On the mi uh, mileage, hmm. let me see. Tell me I just don't eat at those cafes. But <laughs> 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 well, what I found kind of weird was uh, back in the olden days, which is for me the nineties. Um, they were considering California adding a special uh, special registration fee for trucks because they would be all classified as commercial. Didn't matter if you just. You know, use that. Which is that's one. that's ridiculous. Not all trucks are commercial. Well, it's that's what no, people no, argued. But it is. <laughs> they didn't do it either, right? No, no. A lot of people oh, yeah. complain because it was ridiculous. That's how you. That's, that's what. Well, I didn't realize in Colorado you need a truck plate, like license plates, different. Oh, you I, need that in uh, Illinois too. 
it's not it's, it's kind of silly because it's not like you need to do much you just say oh i'm getting these plates for a truck and then they give you truck plates i think there's yeah. a different fee and they give they they the same plates more? in california but they just charge you more um in fact they used to, it's funny they finally they used to charge if you had a cap on your truck they wouldn't charge you by like the gross vehicle weight rating um you would get a loser charge but they finally eliminated that a couple of years ago because people were rolling in to with their truck their caps on their trucks to get a lower rate on the uh on the registration and then taking them off oh yeah so yeah we had a truck it was pretty nice but it was also a gas guzzler so that's yeah. the problem right like they're harder to park if you're in a city and they they use a lot of gas but and everyone use- calls you on the truck they need to move something hey Roger, <laughs> did you come over that's the problem. I mean, it does yeah. depend on the truck. You're right, Patrick. But but pound for pound, you can always find a more fuel efficient sedan than you can a truck. Yeah, I'm not arguing that. Well, I mean, I, yeah. but it was also. I mean, it's funny when I when I went, when I got the big Dodge, the the Cummins. The thing that made me laugh is it has a you know a 5.9 liter engine, but it got better. It got better mileage than the three liter in the Ranger. Oh yeah. The three, you know, it got uh-huh. better mileage than the. Uh, yeah, we got better miles than the Ranger. It got better miles than the 3.4 in the T100, uh, and it got better mileage than the Volvo. Um, <laughs> well, probably get, like, and and plus, well, as far as diesel, older, that gas ma- gas mileage gets worse. So, yeah. what what's like what's like the like average like highway gas mileage of what you're talking about, Patrick? For my particular truck, yeah, um, the one who get the the, the diesel. Yeah, but- I can get like 20. Um, yeah, you know, that's, but it's that's extremely high for on par with the nice sedan. Yeah, I was gonna say that's about the same as the Audi I- Eileen has. Yeah, and even my Prius is down down in the high 20s, low 30s these days because it's so old. Huh. Is it because so, it's so old, or is it because because mileage? I, I'll be honest with you, mileage shouldn't actually drop that much as the car gets older unless there's significant damage to the engine i mean well, could it be because three, three, significant three, damage to the engine <laughs> or, or maybe it's well, or three, damage to the battery right does, the yeah battery i was going to say if the if the no, batteries the battery are worn replaced out. in 2013 so it's about halfway through its life and i did not notice yeah. halfway through the life the previous time i did not notice this dip mm. no, i still average 28 miles a gallon on my camry that's good it's you know what? I'm impressed I mean, with that you car. Could, yeah, you could do I better, it, right? But lot. that's that's was, you know the high twenties is that's good. I was also at eleven thousand miles on it. <laughs> My first Honda Civic hatchback, which was in 1984, I bought it much later, um, but it was my first car. Got almost forty miles to the gallon. Yeah. That little car was. I don't know why I ever got rid of it. I've got one hundred forty thousand miles on my car too. Like it's it's been around. Jen's car. Oh man, I want to get Jen's car over two hundred before I decide to do anything with it, like ditch it. But I want to get it really close to needing to have the uh, drive battery replaced again, and then. <laughs> well, I'm impressed then, because yeah. Patrick's driven my wife's car. It's this little black uh, Scion XD. That thing, you know, I'm impressed. Like as soon as I swapped out the, I replaced all the struts and the shocks mm-hmm. on it. It handles a lot better. I mean, the tiles, tires, the the tires you're supposed to put on it are an oddball size, so you always have to special order, or I could get something wider. Um, For a Scion, that's annoying. But it gets great gas mileage. It's pretty durable, and it doesn't have a lot of features, so there's not a lot to break on it. Mm-hmm. Always a big plus. Just got to top it off with oil because <laughs> it burns oil. 160, 150. Did you like add comment miles. tags to the MP3 in the template, Roger? Or did, uh, or did the system do that? No, I did. You did that. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was it's just because curious. I've been noticing sometimes it, it replaces it and adds that weird garbage. Yeah. Well, I changed the template this morning to get to 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 try to get rid of that same garbage. So I was curious if what I did caused that or oh, if no, you no. done it. No, that was totally that was the hand of Chang. Hand yeah, no, that's good. That's good. It's good that it was you. That I would rather it be that. Um 
Oh, uh, should we say bid adieu to our YouTube stream? Yes, thank you, uh, video folks, uh, for watching, and have a pleasant weekend. Audio folks, stick around. There's more to come. Have a wonderful weekend, video. Whoa. What happened? <laughs>